Hello everyone, my name is Simon. In this video, we'll continue with the project of the last video, the real-time black hole. Today, I want to improve the shader to make it more accurate. At the end of the last video, we discussed two improvements that could be done. One had to do with the camera not being infinitely far away, and the other was about the environment only being the skybox. Today, I want to tackle the correction for the distance of the camera to the black hole. I may do the other one at some point in the future, but it would require a lot more work, so we'll see. Also, I have created a Git repository for this project, where you can find everything we use in this video, as well as the last one. I've uploaded the entire Unity project, so you can just download it and open it with the Unity editor and play around with it. For those who are not using Unity, you can still find the texture we'll be creating in this video in there, as well as a code for making it. Links are in the description. Let's start with an overview of what we want to do. We want to take the distance of the camera to the black hole into account. Remember from the last video that the deflection angle was a function of b over m. Thus now we want to express the deflection angle as a function of two variables, b over m and the distance r of the camera to the black hole. We used an algebraic function to approximate the deflection angle. However, it would be very difficult to try and expand this function to two variables. Instead, we'll use a texture. So we want to somehow bake the deflection angle into a texture, where the horizontal coordinate of a pixel encodes the value of b over m, the vertical coordinate of a pixel encodes r, and the color contains the deflection angle. The precise way in which b over m and r are encoded into the pixel coordinates is very important, but we'll discuss that after we go through the math. If you don't care about math or don't have the mathematical background to follow along, you can just skip ahead. We'll start with our schematic of a light ray orbit. Let's say our camera is here at a distance rc. We can draw a tangent line here. This angle, let's call it alpha, is what we need to know, because this is a correction for the camera position. The actual deflection angle of the light ray is delta phi def minus alpha. Okay, so we need to find alpha. Whenever I'm thinking of how to solve a problem like this, I like to start by listing quantities that we do know to see if there's something we can use. In this case, we have calculated the r d phi in the last video. So what I came up with was to calculate the slope of this tangent line. If you know the slope, we know alpha, because this is just the arc tangent of the slope. But how do we calculate the slope? Well, let's start by writing it mathematically, dy dx. We can convert polar coordinates into Cartesian coordinates using these formulas. And now we can connect the dots. dy dx is equal to dy dphi divided by dx dphi, and both of these we can find from the conversion formulas. The expression for the slope of the tangent is then this. Phi we can find by integrating d phi dr from r equals infinity up to r. This works, except for one detail. Remember when we had an expression for the r d phi squared back in the first video, and we said we could ignore the negative root? Well, that sloppiness is coming to haunt us now. Here, the sign of the root is very important. So we need to decide which one to take. If the r d phi is positive, this means that for increasing phi, r increases as well. So that's this half of the orbit. On the contrary, if the r d phi is negative, this means that for increasing phi, r decreases. So that's this half of the orbit. Since we've defined the coordinate system such that the camera is on the half of the orbit that's going to theta is zero, we need to choose the negative sign. We now have all the mathematics done, it's time to create our texture. I'm using Python for this part because it has all the tools we'll need, but you can use whatever you like. We start by importing all the libraries we're going to use. NumPy for handling arrays, matplotlib for making plots, scipy for numerically integrating and solving functions, and image.io for saving the texture. Next, we define some functions that we'll need. This first one, mapRange, is just a handy function to map a value linearly from one interval to another. More importantly are the next three, bracket, integrand, and delta phi func. These implement parts of the function for the deflection angle as we calculated in the previous video. 
Let's bring in the equation so it's easier to follow. The function bracket returns what's in these brackets. Integrant returns the entire integrant, so that's 1 divided by the square root of the bracket. Finally, delta phi func calculates delta phi, so that's twice this integral minus pi. Next, we implement the calculation of alpha. To start, we implement this expression for dr d phi. Next, we can implement dy dx. It was more convenient to have dy dx as a function of w, so that's a little different than what we said earlier. Ignore this part for a second. We calculate r and phi, and then return dy dx by implementing this expression. This part here is just to check whether w is larger than w1, where w1 is the turning point. If the given w is larger than w1, it is an invalid input. However, as we'll see in a bit, we are going to have invalid inputs in the process of making the texture. So instead of throwing an error, we'll return zero. Next, we have the calculate alpha function, which takes in the slope, so dy dx, and phi. However, we just said that the angle alpha was just the arc tangent of the slope. So what are we doing here? To answer this, let's start by using just the arc tangent of the slope and see where it goes wrong. Here is a plot of three different orbits with different impact parameters. And here is a plot of alpha as a function of w for these orbits. So here on the right, each curve represents a different orbit and each point on a curve is a different position of the camera along the orbit. The turning point w1 is a different value for different impact parameters. So in order to compare the behavior of alpha for different orbits, it is helpful to divide w by w1 on the x-axis, so that each orbit fits in the range of 0 to 1. It just looks a little better. Using just the arc tangent of the slope to calculate alpha, this right plot looks like this. You can see that there's something going wrong over here. We see the blue and orange line go up to about 1.5 and then jump to minus 1.5 and continue going up. We can also see that for the green orbit this doesn't happen, because its curve doesn't get high enough. Now look at the orbits again. For the orange orbit, the turning point is here, and for the blue orbit it's here. So for a part of the orbit, the tangent has a negative slope. Therefore, the arc tangent will give a negative value. But we don't want that. What we want is that a negative slope results in a alpha between pi over 2 and pi. We can do that by adding pi and then doing modulo pi. So for a positive slope, what this will do is adding pi, and then the modulo operator removes that pi again. So in the end, nothing happens. For a negative slope, adding pi to the arc tangent will result in an angle between pi over 2 and pi, so the modulo operator does nothing. Remaking this plot again, we see that the orange curve is fixed now, but the blue curve still has something going on at the very end. Looking at the blue orbit, we see that over here, the slope is positive again. So the arc tangent will return this angle. However, at this point, the orbit already turned more than 180 degrees. So to fix this, we need to add pi to the arc tangent. And that's what we do here. If pi is more than 270 degrees and the slope is positive, we add pi. Technically, there are also orbits that go around twice or more, and for those orbits, we would need to add pi twice or more. But in reality, those orbits are so close to the circular orbits that they don't really happen, unless your image is like 16k or something ridiculous like that. So I'm ignoring that. That's the calculate alpha function done. And with that, we can start making our texture. But first, we need to think about how we want to encode B and R into the X and Y pixel coordinates. Let's look at B first. This is the deflection angle as a function of B, like we did in the previous video. You can see it's a very sharp peak and then mostly flat. If we would take the pixel X coordinate to be linear in B, we would need an extremely high resolution image to capture the detail of the sharp peak but then 90% of our x-axis would be wasted on the part of the function that is pretty much flat. So this is a very inefficient way to do it. On top of that, we would only be able to capture a finite part of the function, 
while the function stretches out to b equals infinity. We can solve both of these problems by making the pixel x coordinates inversely proportional to b. So on the x-axis we have m over b instead of b over m. Look at the function of the deflection angle on this new axis. Yes, we still have a sharp peak, but now this peak takes up about half of the axis, instead of like 10%. So we have drastically improved the resolution there. The flat part of the function is now compressed to the other half of the axis. And on top of that, the entire function now fits in the finite x-axis, because b going to infinity corresponds with 1 over b going to 0. So we decided how to encode b. Now let's discuss r. We have less knowledge of how r influences the deflection angle and how this function looks. What we do know is that we want to cover a large range of r and that we want to have good resolution for small r, because that's where things will change most. We could do another inversely proportional axis, but I chose a logarithmic y-axis. Both of these options are good, they each have different pros and cons, but here I'll go for a logarithmic axis. Then we need to decide what range in R we want to cover. I chose a lower bound of 3m, because at that distance, when you point the camera to a black hole, you'll just see black. So there's no reason to go lower. The upper bound of R is totally dependent on how far away you want your black hole to be visible. I chose an upper bound of 1000m, because at that point it's pretty much invisibly small. Within the range of 3m and 1000m, I think most applications are covered. So that gives us these axes. Now all we need to do is fill in the texture. To start, we make an array for the x and y axis. These are arrays going from 0 to 1, not including 0. From these, we calculate b for every x coordinate and r for every y coordinate. Then for every b, we calculate delta phi. We prepare a 2D array to contain all the pixels and then fill them in one by one. For each pixel, we calculate alpha and save delta phi minus alpha. Finally, we save the image. First, we make sure we have float32 values. Then we need to flip the y-axis. This is because on an image, the 0, 0 pixel is in the top left, while in 3D software, the UV coordinate 0, 0 is in the lower left corner. Finally, we write it to a TIFF file. This TIFF file format is important because classic image formats like JPEG or PNG do not support float values, only integers. That gives us this image, which looks mostly black, because on the color scale here on the right, you can see that we have values ranging from 0 to about 11. To get a better view of what's going on, we can put the color in log scale. And now you can see a discontinuous line that crosses the entire image. This is due to our dy/dx function, where we return 0 for invalid inputs. This entire area of the image is invalid inputs in the sense that for those values of r, b can physically not be that large. That also means that this invalid area of the texture is never going to be accessed, so we don't have to care about the color values in there. Let's take a look at the shader to see what's changed. We're now in the black hole shader, and actually the only thing that's changed is over here, the deflection angle subgraph. It now takes in B and M as before, but also the distance of the camera to the black hole R. This new deflection angle subgraph looks like this. It's the same as the previous one, only the approximation function is now replaced with this part. We have our texture here which returns the deflection angle. The UV that we pass in here is determined by R and B. The square root of 27 divided by B over M gives us the X coordinate. And for the Y coordinate, we take the log of R over M and map it from the log three to three range to zero to one. And that's it. We now have a very accurate black hole shader. Here you can see the result with the old shader. And this is a new one. You can see that with the new shader, light gets bent slightly less. That's going to be it for me today. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. And I hope to see you whenever I decide to make another video. Cheers.